Hello everyone and welcome to Daily News Simplified, your one-stop solution for the detailed analysis of the current affairs which are published in the daily edition of the Hindu newspaper and are equally relevant for your UPSC preparation. Articles dated for 8th of June 2023 are listed on your screen and the time stamping for these articles along with the notes in PDF and Word format are given in the description box. But before starting the first article, we have certain announcements to make. Dear Aspirants, Rouse IAS is going to conduct the mains revision classes for 2023 which will prepare you for the mains 23 examination. As you must be well aware that these classes have boosted the score of many IAS toppers. For example, Anandya Rashri, Pooja Jha, Namrata Chaube and helped them to score a good rank in the top 100. As far as features of this program is concerned, so all the students and the participants are going to get 150 hours of revision classes that will cover all the important subjects, important themes in the question and answered format. Students will also get one-to-one -one mentorship in unlimited format. There will be a dedicated means test series that will help you to simulate exam-like experience and revise your syllabus in the time-bound manner. This test series will also provide you the timely feedback which will help you to score even more. All the teachers taking the classes will be providing you the important and relevant notes which will be handy for you to revise in the last time. There will be 4 hours of classes every day between Monday to Friday. The teachers would include Baswa Open for Economics, Mr. Fezan Khan for Ethics, Weber Mishra for Polity, Gaurav Tripathi for Environment and Geography, Ankit Kaul for International Relations. Mr. Arun Bharadwaj for Science and Technology. The second announcement is with respect to the optional test series from Political Science that is open under the guidance of Rahul Puri sir. This test series would include 16 tests, 8 sectional and 8 full length tests along with the evaluation with sample answers and detailed feedback. Over 40 hours of classes comprising detailed test discussion will be conducted for the subscribers. The detailed schedule of the entire test series has been displayed on your screen. In order to know more and subscribe to this test series, there is a link given in the description box that you can follow. Now let us begin the first article for today's DNS. This article of the Hindu newspaper appeared on the business page and tells us about the crops shortages that are going to be there in near future that might ignite the more higher inflationary pressure. Because as per many economists, any increase in the MSP or the minimum support price will ultimately bring burden on the inflation not only in the rural areas but also in the urban sites. Because of this, RBI might under the monetary policy committee can increase or keep their policy interest rates stable. The context says that the spillover effect, now what is the spillover effect? Means the effect which will be on the other sector because of the one sector. So once the food prices are higher, because of the remuneration given to the farmers through MSP or the minimum support price, there might be a pressure of higher inflation in the near future. Now please understand this. Let's say there is a farmer one and this farmer was getting 100 rupees as MSP or minimum support price for his wheat. But this year, that is in 2023, the same farmer is going to get 120 rupees for the same level of output. Now, the article is saying that if there is a shortage, let's say the output has reduced. And despite that, the increase in the MSP has been observed. Now, this farmer has 20 rupees extra in his pocket. This 20 rupees means higher demand from this farmer's side and you know demand pull inflation so demand pull inflation can occur in the ruler side and this will ultimately put pressure from the supply side coming from the urban areas and that is one of the reason which was highlighted in this article as far as labor's mapping is concerned so this article is going to be on the minimum support price which is given as a direct notation under General Studies Paper 3. Apart from this, we will also look into some of the elements of the public distribution system in India. So the discussion for today would include the simplification of this article, all about MSP, because this year's prelim examination 2023, one question from Niger Seed was asked, which is one of the component of the MSP in India. 
So we will look into the MSPs, issues with MSP in India, issues with respect to the MSP given in India but at the global level that is agreement on agriculture with respect to World Trade Organization. And lastly, we will look into some of the possible way forwards in this regard. Before starting the topic, you should know that MSP, Public Distribution System or the peripheral subjects have been asked multiple times in the mains examination for the UPSC. For example, in 2020, there was a right wheat system and its success where MSP is very important element. Then there was a crop diversification which has been impacted by the MSP. Then there was a direct question on the food grain distribution under PDS. Minimum support price as its own topic or literally was asked in 2018. Agriculture Product Market Committees or APMCs which are one of the element of MSP and the public distribution system were also asked in 2014. So one way or the other, this topic has been very, very important from the UPSC's mains examination. And not only that, this year's prelim examination, a question was asked with respect to the nigger seeds or niger seeds, in which the answer to the question according to Rao's answer key is option C. If you want to know the answers to the various other questions which were asked in the prelims 2023, you can go to the Compass site of Rao's IAS. The discussion that we are going to conduct will help you to solve this mains practice question because mains are approaching this year. So if you go through the entire discussion that we are going to conduct, you will be in a position to answer this question with any ease. We are going to discuss this question in the last, but before that, let's begin the topic. So the gist of the article says that about 5 to 11% extra increase can be observed or could be observed in the upcoming inflationary data. The reason is that food production is likely to be low this year. On the other hand, government has already promised to increase the minimum support price on certain goods. This would definitely raise the price because supply is low and demand is high. So this demand and supply mismatch is going to increase the prices because of the clause of scarcity. Scarcity leads to the price rise. Now, because of this higher prices, Monetary Policy Committee under Reserve Bank of India is going to consider this as one of the element while deciding the important policy rates, for example, the repo rates, and they are going to consider raising the policy rates or might not reduce them, keeping them at the original position, which will ultimately keep the availability of the credit to the other sectors. Now, because the policy rates or rate of interest is high, let's say the repo rate remains high, the credit given by the banking sector to the industrial sector, the loans or the industrial loans that are being dispersed may remain expensive. Because of this expensive loans, credit availability will be less. Industrial sector will go into a setback. This will further create a demand and supply gap in the industrial sector because industries are not able to produce as per the demand in the economy because of the expensive credit line that they are getting. So they are not able to provide the higher supplies and because of this reason, there will be a further inflation and this inflation now will be in the loop. So ruler inflation is causing the urban inflation and ultimately causing the more inflation in the economy as a whole. Now, because of this reason, economists have warned against increasing the MSP in similar manner in the near future. Now, let us understand about the minimum support price regime functioning in India. Now, MSP stands for minimum support price, which is being provided to the farmer on the announcement made by the cabinet committee on the economic affair. And this announcement is based on the recommendation made by a technical committee known by the term Commission on Agricultural Cost and Prices on which UPSC has already asked a question in the prelims. Now the reason for providing MSP is that we need to incentivize the farmer to invest in the agriculture. Higher price will provide profit margin to the farmer and these profit margins will help them to save more and ultimately invest more in their next crop. So this is first objective. The second is to prevent the farmer from selling in the 
open market with distress prices because see market plays on the demand and supply reason and once demand and supply does not matches the farmer is going to lose what if the supply is far more than demand so there will be surplus and that is one of the reason why most of the time you'll see that farmers especially the horticulture crops fruits and vegetables are being thrown in the open because they do not get even the cost of production in the market now the question arises that once the msps are fixed but how they are fixed so there are three different approaches to calculate the minimum support price that how much a crop should be priced how much government should pay the money to the farmer depends on three different methods the first one is a2 method where the expenditure on various inputs paid by the farmer for example how much he has paid for seeds fertilizers pesticides labor etc all will be clubbed together the second method is when a2 that is above input cost will be added along with the cost of family labor so see if a wife of a farmer is working on the field what she is doing she is acting as an alternative labor that the farmer could have bought from the market but if this farmer was about to call somebody from outside the market he would have paid him something but his wife is working on the field without that payment but that effort should not go in vain the wife whatever input she is putting up should be considered as a implied cost or indirect cost and that should be brought into the msp decision so higher msp also provide a kind of indirect wages to the wife working on the field the third method is c2 method where a2 fl plus implied cost of rent of the land and other implied cost many other indirect cost are included as of now c2 is not used so what government of india is using as of now msp is fixed at 1.5 times of all india weighted average now this is a controversial thing because see whatever you are paying to a farmer in let's say punjab does not justify what a farmer in bihar should get so all india weighted average this average should be looked into by the government it's a one size fits all approach to every state which should not be the case so an average of every crop is being calculated utilizing the a to fl approach or the second approach and this approach was adopted in 2018 19 budget this is how it is decided let's say the cost of seed fertilizer pesticides labor and including the family labor turns out to be 200 rupees per kg it now this should be multiplied by 1.5 that is the msp is going to be around 300 rupees per kg of a particular crop so this is how it is decided now msp is decided per quintal per 100 kg highest msp in india as per 2023 is paid to copra or coconut and sesame so as far as non copra crops are concerned it is sesame which is being paid highest and the lowest msp goes to barley now please do not think that it is because of the discrimination between these crops the reason is that the cost of production of barley is far less than the cost of production of copra or sesame now when it comes to the commodities which are being covered now this is very very important so i'll put 3 star over here especially for upsc's prelim examination twice and even thrice they have asked direct or indirect questions from these crops so there are seven cereals five pulses seven oil seeds and four commercial crops which includes sugar cane now sugar cane is not paid msp as such it is paid fair and remuneration prices by the central government and state advised price by the respective state government if they wish to pay so these are 22 plus sugar cane now please do not get confused it is on the basis of the website of commission 
on agricultural cost and prices so if you want to read more you can go through the website of this particular commission where 22 plus sugarcane is given the initiatives which were taken up in order to provide benefits under MSP with respect to certain crops was PM Asha. In this, benefit of oil seeds and pulses were given to the farmer through price support scheme where farmers are provided the price support, price deficiency payment system or payment scheme where if there is a deficiency in what farmer is getting in the market and the MSP that will be paid to the farmer and third pilot of the private procurement and stockist scheme it means that private procurement see msp is a public procurement in this pm asha private procurement for oil seeds and pulses not for wheat maize or anything other just oil seeds and pulses where private procurement could be taken up as a project but that is only a pilot project not an all india project now the question arises that okay this is a particular method of calculating the prices but what are the components what are the determinants of MSP now these are the seven eight determinants which have different components the first cost of production so highest cost of production will get highest MSP that is for sure what is the demand and supply mechanism of that particular crop let's say rice so what is the demand of rice in India? What is the supply of rice in India? That will determine whether MSP is right or wrong. Intercrop price parity. If we compare rice with other crops grown on the same field, let's say a farmer is growing rice along with sugar cane. Now that farmer is going to benefit more because both of them are covered under MSP. But if rice is being supplemented in the intercropping from let's say horticulture, now horticulture is not covered under MSP. So here the price parity will be different. Then comes the effect on cost of living. Higher MSP will improve the cost of living or not. Or lower MSP will affect the cost of living of the farmer and the family or not. Then comes the price factors. So change in the input prices, input output, price parity. Trends in the market prices in India effects on the general price level in India that is inflation on which this article was actually based. International price situation. So whenever government decides MSP they also keep in mind that what are the international prices of a particular crop. Because see if MSP is very high let's say in the international market the price of wheat is 50 rupees kg and in India because of the MSP Let's say the price of wheat is 70 rupees a kg. In that case, India will never be able to export India's wheat. So India's export parity will remain very weak. Hence, international price situations are also considered. And the last price matter is parity between the price paid and the price received from the farmer. That is terms of trade with respect to agriculture and the other industries. So if farmer is getting more through MSP and he is paying less to the other sector, other sector are actually going to face hurdles. The second last is effect on issue price and the implications for subsidy on consumer. So the point is if MSP is high while PDS is low, there is going to be a loss to the government. Now who is going to bear this loss? Of course the taxpayers. Plus, if MSP is increased and on the other hand government increase the PDS also, what will be the impact on the consumer? Will the consumer be able to pay more, especially the poor consumer? So this is also considered and the last one is a minimum of 50% as a margin over the cost of production is being added. That is the reason why it is 1.5x of the cost of production. Now the point is how MSP is being transformed into the PDS. So if you go through this flowchart, you'll find that these are the following farmers who are growing a particular crop. Now we'll take the example of rice in this case. Let's say these are the farmers from different states. So what they will do? They will come to Mandi or the purchase center. Over here, there will be the collection of the produce. From here, there will be surplus state warehouses where this production will be taken up. For this, there will be Food Corporation of India Limited for various crops. 
there will be cotton cooperation of india and jute cooperation of india for jute and cotton respectively now these many organizations along with some state organization for the procurement will try to keep it at a particular surplus warehouse or the fci godowns let's say this godown is situated in uttar pradesh now from uttar pradesh this surplus item will go to the deficit state let's say the state of gujarat where rice is not easily being grown so from here rail transport will be there from here there will be road transport because here district level warehouses of fci will be given here the role of the state government is taken up so state government will distribute from district level warehouse it will go to the ration shops or the fair price shops and from fair price shop under the public distribution system it will be given to the poor beneficiaries or the people who are eligible under national food security act so from here what do we understand individual farmers group of farmers middlemen central government state government and the poor beneficiaries are the components of the msp to public distribution system in india and this is how the entire program functions after this entire discussion we should look into what are the problems that government's pricing policy under msp is being facing now these are the important one these are extremely useful for your mains examination for your general studies paper 3 the first is that there is delay in the announcement of msp most of the time it has been seen that once kharif or ravi seasons are already over government comes up with the announcement of a particular crop then comes the lower msp even the swaminathan committee had already recommended that the c2 method where other implied cost or the other indirect cost should be included in order to provide the msp to the farmer for bringing more parity and more prosperity to this farmer families then comes the poor coverage in terms of agricultural commodities so horticulture is already out then we do not have milk in this and even all the important crops are not included there is a skewed procurement of rice and wheat from north india so majority of the rice and the wheat comes from north india especially from the states like punjab haryana and western uttar pradesh while if you talk about the other states for example the northeastern states central part of india and even the coastal state they are very very limited in terms of the participation in the procurement then benefited only the large farmers that to in north india it has promoted the cultivation of water intensive crops for example rice paddy and sugarcane and that is one of the reason uh, because of which regions in central part of india especially vidarbha are going through the dry phase or dry spells because of the extensive use of water in the sugarcane it has also failed to address the impact of the needs for pulses and the oil seeds thanks to the pm aasha scheme otherwise pulses and the oil seeds would have seen a very major setback in terms of how they are being procured shanta kumar committee in 2015 suggested that only 6% of the msp could be received by the farmers while 94% does not especially in the case of northeast india then there is the presence of middlemen and these middlemen are mostly the commission agents and those who are under the control of apmcs they have to pay heavy fees fines penalties commissions to these people that ultimately raises the prices there is high procurement the policy of open ended procurement that whatever you bring to the market will be procured by the government and that is one of the reason that it has led to the surplus of the procurement over and above the targets ultimately leading to the wastage of the food because fci does not have enough space to store these food before the procurement while they are being kept openly under the sky sometimes precipitation waste all these food msp is seen as the only mean to raise farmers income in many states for example in the states like punjab and haryana it has been observed that politicians as well as the farm leaders are seeing msp to be the only source 
of increasing the farmer's income. But it should be the mean to the last resort. There should be more other means to raise farmer's income. For example, mixed farming. For example, animal husbandry. And the last problem with the MSP is that it has provided some environmental damages. Because of the skewedness in terms of the cropping pattern, rice and wheat are being promoted. Sugarcane is being promoted and that has led to the depletion of the groundwater resources in many states, especially the states like Haryana. Excessive water has led to the alkalinity and the salinity in the soil that has already degraded the soil quality, especially in the alluvial soil. Now the question arises that what should be done? The first one is instead of dictating and benefiting just few farmers, MSP should act as a last resort. So it should be as a last resort, okay, not the first one, that farmer should not only be dependent on MSP, he should go for the diversification of the agriculture. And market forces should take the lead. See, market acts on demand and supply mechanism. So if demand and supply are equal, farmer will be benefited. If demand is more than supply, farmer will benefit because of the higher prices that they are going to return. But if demand is less than supply, then comes the role of the government. That yes, farmer is not getting enough. Then role, government can call the farmers, buy from them and pay them equal to the MSP. Then comes the judicious procurement of crops to keep intact the nutritional security in India. See, we are focusing less on the pulses, oil seeds and of course the coarse cereals. Because of the limited coarse cereals, Government of India could not sustain the nutritional security through their PDS program or the midday meal. We should also go for rationalizing MSP. Because of the rationalizing MSP, we can save money. The saved money can be invested in capitalizing the agriculture productivity. Let's say providing cheaper electricity to the farmer, providing infrastructure such as roads, power, banking facilities, high yielding seeds to the farmer. And the last way is to provide the loss margin to the farmer. In this we have Bhavantar Bhuktan Yojana from Madhya Pradesh, where the margin between the MSP and the market price is being provided to the farmer just to cover their losses and not the entire money is paid to the farmer. Now with this discussion, let us now move towards the another important topic that how MSP is being seen at World Trade Organization's Agreement on Agriculture and what are the issues that India faces with respect to this element over there. Well, Agreement on Agriculture basically aims to facilitate the international trade in agricultural goods. Only agricultural goods, not non-agriculture goods. For that, we have NAMA, which means Non-Agricultural Market Access. In this, WTO provides market access to those goods which are in non-agriculture category. But today, we will focus on Agreement on Agriculture. The basic objective of this agreement is to provide a cap or a limit on the agriculture subsidy that could be provided by a particular member countries under WTO. This agreement stands on three pillars, domestic support, market access and export subsidies. First is the domestic support that we will discuss in detail. The second is the market access, which simply means tarification, converting the non-tariff barriers into tariff barriers or in fact reduction of the tariffs. It is just like this, India provides ample tariff reduction to the African nations when it comes to pulses. Then we have export subsidies. These subsidies are provided in order to export a particular good in the international market. And then there is the special and differential treatment also known by SNDT. These treatments are provided on the basis of the economy of a particular nation. So lower the economy means more treatment could be provided in order to develop a particular nation's agricultural economy. Now coming to the domestic support, this is the major cause of concern. Domestic support includes the three types of subsidies that could be provided or could be restricted as far as international trade on agriculture goods are concerned. First is the green box subsidy. I believe most of you have already studied these. We have discussed this multiple times previously. Well, this is the most important topic as far as agricultural trade is concerned. So we will discuss it once more. Well, green box subsidy includes the subsidy given for research and development, expansion of irrigation facility like we have Indira Gandhi Canal. Then comes the income support given to the farmer. Then 
like we have Kisan Samman Nidhi. These subsidies are basically non-distortionary. That means it does not distort the international trade or prices of a product. They are government funded. So it is not the private investment which is coming under this subsidy. And there is no limit as they are non-distorting. There is no limit on these subsidies. Government can provide n number of subsidies or n number of amount. Then comes the blue box subsidy. These are the subsidies which are tied to a particular program that limit the production. This may include provisions such as production quotas that farmers will not produce anything beyond this quantity or they also require farmer to set at a, aside a part of their land for particular objective. India does not provide any kind of major blue box subsidy. Countries like Norway, Iceland provide such kind of subsidies. Okay, the real issue comes from the amber box subsidy. This includes all supports or measures that distort the production. Distort the production means either increase or decrease the entire macro production intentionally. And this causes the distortion in the international trade. It includes subsidy provided for electricity provided in India, subsidies provided for fertilizer that too provided in India and others like seed, waster and MSP. Now, as these subsidies provide the kind of distortion in the international trade, they are subjected to reduction or they are subjected to de minimis. De minimis means that nations will have to reduce, minimize their quantity of releasing these kind of subsidies to the farmers. These subsidies are limited on the following grounds. So, we have limit on the amber box subsidies because they are the trade distorting. For developing countries, it is limited to 10% of the total value of production of their produce with the base year of 1986 to 88. And for developed countries like America and others, it is 5%. Now, for those students who do not understand this clearly, let me simplify this for you. Let us assume that India has produced 100 million tons of food grain this year. Now, on the basis of amber box subsidies de minimis clause, India can provide a subsidy to only 10 million tons of food because of the 10% criteria. US or European Union can provide subsidy to only 5 million tons of food. Now, the point is, India is a developing country. India is also a poor country where over 300 million people are below poverty line. Now, India is saying that why you are providing the restrictions or amber box subsidies and not on the green box subsidies because green box subsidy include the income support. So, America can provide income support to a larger extent because it is a developed country. It is a rich country, but India cannot do that on the same ground. So, we need indirect subsidies. We need electricity subsidy. We need fertilizer subsidy, MSP subsidy. And that is the real issue, which is as of now is becoming a matter of concern on the international platform. So this is the current issue. These agreement does not provide ample space for expanding the stock holding under minimum support price because government buy from the farmers and store it under the food corporation of India's go downs. So stock holding is limited. Then government also says that they are going through the poverty. India is going through the poverty issue. Okay, so for that regard, India has to put up extra subsidies. So India wants to go for peace clause. And for this peace clause, India wants that this 10% criteria of de minimis under amber box subsidies should have a clause of waiver. Because as we have seen in the case of COVID-19 crisis, what happened? Government of India has promised more amount of MSP based food under the public distribution system. And this is the reason why instead of going for 10% minimum criteria, India has reached 13% of minimum food subsidy being provided. So India wants that the de minimis clause should be revived and should be and should not be made mandatory for each and every period irrespective of the economic situation. So it should be based on the economic situation. And secondly, and developed nations should come forward in order to reduce their own subsidies. So as you can see, government of India has talked about peace clause and its more extension in the future as well. 
Now, what are the implications of legalizing the MSP as per the World Trade Organization? Well, this was also the concern which was raised in the article. Now, if India wants to legalize MSP, legalizing MSP means India will have to buy from each and every farmer from each and every corner of the country. Now, this will overshoot India's subsidy beyond 10%. And that will create issues for India on World Trade Organization and India might get sanctions on its international trade. And this is one of the reasons why India is reluctant to legalize the MSP regime as of now. So what could be the way forward? Well, provide income support. Kisan Samman Nidhi is one initiative which has provided the direct income support of 6,000 per year to each farmer in the country. Government can rationalize the subsidy, save money out of that and can expand the monetary benefit under this scheme or under any other scheme through income support. Now, after the entire discussion, we come to this question. Despite best of their efforts, both center and the state, minimum support price could neither bring parity in the agriculture now, in terms of the crop, in terms of the productivity, nor it has raised much of farmers' income. So, please justify with all the discussion that we have conducted, limitations, conditions and all. Discuss the factors behind such a performance of MSP. You should try to answer this question in 250 words. With this discussion, please, let us now move to the next article for the day. This article on the Hindu newspaper appeared on page 12 and talks about the India-US trade relationship in respect to the export control regulation. Now, the article is dedicated to the defense exports. However, we are going to look into the overall India-US trade status and what are the existing issues between India and US with respect to the trade. Now, US and Indian representatives have now promised to streamline their export control regime for crucial technologies at India-US strategic trade dialogue. See, India is a rising defense power and India requires strategic and the critical technologies. And US, as you all know, is the best defense power in the world, can easily provide India such technologies. But the technological transfer between two countries with respect to defense depends upon how strategically they are associated with each other. Given the Ukraine-Russia crisis, India has never criticized Russia for anything. India and Russia have all-weather friendship as far as defense is concerned. And US, being apprehensive of this development, always require India to be more pro-US and anti-Russia with respect to the defense procurement. So US more or less arm twist India on the technology transfer. And that is one of the reason why export control regulations are intensive between these two countries. On the basis of sleepers mapping, this topic is important under your journal studies paper to India's international relations. And some of the topics can also be covered under the security aspects of your journal studies paper three. The content will be on the two sides, that is India-US trade status. We'll look into what is the basic status between these two countries and what are the trade issues being faced by these two nations. So let's start with the current status of the trade between India and US. India has now emerged as India's biggest trading partner. Now, please remember this. This is an important fact. So who is the India's topmost trading partner? It is US. The total trade in 2022-23 stands around $128 billion, in which India's export to US was $78 billion, while India's import were $50 billion. So there was a complete trade surplus of $28 billion, which is also the highest. So if tomorrow UPSC asks that with which country or with which nation India holds the largest trade surplus, it should be US. With China, which is stood at second position, India's total trade is 113 billion, but here the trade deficit is very, very high. UAE with 76 billion stand at third, the fourth is Saudi Arabia, and the fifth trading partner of India is Singapore. Major trading items from export sites, that is India to US, includes petroleum, polished diamonds, pharmaceuticals, where India, of course, holds the prime position along with the jewelry, light oils and petroleums, frozen shrimps for the food items and other made-ups. As far as imports are concerned, so of course, petroleum, rough diamonds, 
एल एन जी गोल्ड कोल वेस्ट स्क्रैप्स एंड सम ऑफ द कैलिफोर्निया आर्मस नाउ बेस्ड ऑन दिस एंटायर डिस्कशन वी शुड नो दैट डिस्पाइट बींग द लार्जेस्ट ट्रेडिंग पार्टनर देर आर सर्टन इशूज विच बोथ दीज कंट्रीज फेस विथ रिस्पेक्ट टू ईच अदर इन टर्म्स ऑफ बायोलिट्रल रिलेशनशिप इंडिया कंसर्न एंड यू एस कंसर्न आर बींग हाईलाइटेड ऑन योर स्क्रीन सो लेट डिस्कस सम ऑफ इंडिया कंसर्न ऑन यू एस इंडिया वॉन्ट्स टू रिज्यूम द जर्नलाइज सिस्टम ऑफ प्रिफरेंस विच वॉज रिमूवड फ्रॉम इंडिया अंडर डोनल्ड ट्रम्प टेन्योर Now please understand this what is GSP GSP or generalized system of preference was established in US under the Trade Act of 1974 where US promotes economic development by eliminating the duties tariffs on thousands of products when these products are coming from 119 destinations or the countries see let's say this is the US market and there are two countries which are exporting a particular good and the good is rice here is india and here is russia so if russia is exporting rice to us it will be 100 plus duty if it is coming from india it will be 100 minus duty so any rice coming from india will be duty less so there will be exemptions from the import duties so india will be considered to be under generalized system of preference now this system was not innovated by us please understand that gsp was innovated or adopted by united nation conference on trade and development in new delhi in 1968 adopted and institutionalized in 1971 so when it was institutionalized by uncatad in 1971 after 3 years it was adopted by us now see us is not the only country that has adopted gsp it is a group of 13 countries which are practicing gsp so they are providing duty free or limited duty trade to many many nations in 2018 6.3 billion of india's merchandise trade or exports to us were covered under gsp however the benefit was very very low india is one of the largest beneficiary of gsp but in 2019 it was removed under donald trump's tenure so india is looking to resume the benefits that it was getting under gsp the second is that more market access for indian agro goods automobiles so mahindra tata are looking to sell their cars although they are not as safe as the american cars just a joke apart and india is also looking to sell the engineering goods so india is looking for more market access america should open more market for indian goods the third issue or concern is that imposition of the digital tax facebook google apple or any other company is providing services in india they are us companies and they are made to pay digital tax from indian government which is not liked by us but india wants to impose the digital tax and does not want us to intervene the next is that india has remained on the special list of special 301 priority list made by the usdr or trade representatives on the infringement of ipr especially in the pharma sector so most of the time india has been called as the vulnerable country that utilizes or infringes the intellectual property rights from the pharma sector automobile sector and other technologies being developed in us so india has been targeted to copy these technologies and selling in their market india wants to sign the totalization agreement why because this agreement will help india to provide the social security from the us market to those indians who are using or staying or working in the us the last issue or concern from india is that india has complained on us blocking the appointment to the appellate body in the world trade organization if tomorrow india loses a case india cannot approach the appellate body in world trade organization because members are not there but the same is also beneficial for india because if us loses any case it also cannot approaches the appellate body 
In terms of the US concerns, of course, like India, US are also looking for higher market access, especially for its defense exports. Next is the easy flow of digital data. US want that the data which is being produced in India should not be restricted to India. As we know that India is looking for data localization for its economy. There's a high trade deficit. So US is concerned about it. It is around $28 billion, although it is almost negligible to the US economy, but it remains high. Higher sale of the defense goods is always the priority for the US, but here Russian angle is always one of the concern. So India Russia trade on the defense good has remained a headache for the US representatives on the trade. And the last one is US considered Atma Nirbhar Bharat from Indian government to be a mean of protectionism. See, US now being hypocrite. US is one of the prime proponent of protectionism in terms of what it has been doing with respect to Chinese goods or with respect to China. So US China trade war, we all know there was a case of protectionism. There was a case of bilateralism. The US is one of the prominent anti-multilateralism in terms of international trade. And here it is considering Atman Nirbhar Bharat not as self-reliant program of India as a developing country, but as a mean to protectionism. Now the question arises, what should be done? The first is that both countries can look into going for the free trade agreement, comprehensive economic cooperation agreement that what Indian government call it as. So free trade agreement between both these countries will reduce down the number of tariffs, barriers and others and will help in improving the trade. Now free trade agreement will definitely benefit India. Why? Because of the surplus being enjoyed by India. The second is that both should stand forward in WTO and support for multilateralism. More reliance should be given by India on making India and Atman Nirbhar Bharat in order to reduce down the imports from US. And the last one is India should start lobbying more on the World Trade Organization's reforms, especially the appellate body with like minded nation. And here there are three nations which can help India. The first is, of course, China. The second being Germany and the third being Brazil. So these three countries can definitely help India in boosting the reforms in the World Trade Organization. With this discussion, please let us now move to the next article for the day. This article of the Hindu newspaper appeared in the text and context section and talks about LCC or the low carbon cities. Now India is one such country where the pollution and the urban pollution is extremely high. Most of Indian cities like Delhi, NCR, Kanpur and others have been included in the most polluted cities of the world. So what do we need? We have to go to the transition to the low carbon city. And low carbon here simply means when the CO2 level produced by the countries and the cities are low. In 2020, cities dumped about 29 trillion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which is a very, very high number and a number to be concerned about. Therefore, given the significant impact that these countries and cities have on the environment, we need low carbon or LCC to be as a transition in the urbanization. In terms of the syllabus mapping, this is extremely important point for your general studies paper three under environmental degradation and pollution. So tomorrow UPSC can ask questions on the LCC and their feasibility and how they can be improved and be utilized in countries like India. So today we are going to discuss about that what is energy transition, what is LCC or low carbon city. We are going to look into the flow chart to understand what is low carbon city and how it can be achieved. We are going to look into the planning and the designs for the low carbon cities, how we can achieve low carbon cities in India. Why are the energy system transitions more important for countries like India and what are the different strategies that we can adopt to bring LCCs in India. So let us understand with the concept of energy transition first. Energy transition means transferring from A to B. A is high fossil based energy system to B, which is renewable energy sources such as wind, solar power, lithium ion batteries and others. If energy transition is important, we have to transform from current urbanization to the low carbon cities. So according to World Wildlife Fund 2022, LCC or a low carbon city is the one where low CO2, see the point is low carbon city, not zero carbon city. 
so co2 emission should be low low energy consumption per gdp in the context of the rapid economic development see economic development should go in a rapid manner that does not mean that co2 emission should be high they are crucial for the low carbon economy and reduce or even eliminate the carbon emission see india is looking for net zero emission and if urban centers are not in align with the net zero emission how can india achieve its target so setting up of the low carbon cities across india is the need of the hour now the point is why do we need energy system transition in this regard first if we have to move from the fossil fuel based to the renewable based there should be the reduction in the emission energy system transition can reduce the overall co2 by 74% again a good sign higher accessibility with rapid advancement in the clean energy and the related technologies nose diving prices and nose diving prices we have crossed the economic and the technological barriers to implement the low carbon solutions so higher accessibility is required and the last one is we have to meet the targets of the paris agreement as we were talking about the net zero emission so carbon neutrality is need of the hour for india as well and in this regard low carbon cities can be a game changer tool now let us understand that how a low carbon city is being recognized so these are the parameters on which a city can be recognized whether it is a low carbon or not economic energy water social living carbon environment social waste and urban mobility as far as economic parameters is concerned so yes per capita income should be increasing tertiary activity to the gdp should be high and carbon productivity should be high see the word is carbon productivity not co2 productivity so carbon productivity like the one which is being produced by the forest area should be high as far as energy pattern is concerned the so proportion of renewable energy should be high of course but energy intensity should be low why now please understand this through an example previously we had halogen bulbs or we have other forms of electricity appliances but now we are using leds now leds have reduced the energy intensity but has provided the same level of illumination that is the reason why we are saying energy intensity should be reduced share of waste water treated should be high for example for the public transports for the public parks waste water should be utilized and water consumption intensity should be low per capita proportion of the public green space should be high but population density living in a particular area should be low co2 emission should be low nitrogen should be low so is the suspended particulate matter and sulfur dioxide so pollution wise everything should be on the lower side waste collected and adequately disposed should be high and so is the ratio of waste to energy and waste recycling they should also be high delhi's waste to energy plant is one such example and the last one is urban mobility so public buses per capita should be high rail network should be high but per capita number of cars should be low which is not the case in india everyone is looking to buy a car just to have that urban comfort so the point is all these parameters can be achieved if we have this kind of planning and design first urban renewable and density control should be there so urban planning is required we should have dispersed settlements in the urban areas we need to increase awareness of the energy conservation and the saving for example the bee or bureau of energy efficiency is working in this regard we have to be more selective in the structures and the material being used for the energy conservation for example white terraces are working as a good form of albedo we need to have eco friendly transportation plan which is based on the green energy determination of the boundaries based on the ecological elements forest urban areas parks should always be there and efficient land use should be utilized if all these parameters are being used in the planning and designing we can easily achieve all these indicators of the low carbon city now comes the point what are the different strategies that should be adopted in india's case first current cities can go for retrofitting and repurposing for the infrastructure they will provide energy efficiency we can have active transports like bicycling or the walking we need to have walkable city designs electrifying the public transportation we need to have cooling and the heating networks across cities 
when comes to the question of rapidly growing urban centers we try to co-locate housing and the jobs so as to reduce down the travel time between the housing and the jobs we can bring business places closer to the residential complexes then comes that they can also implement the building codes that mandate net zero you must have heard about the concept of green buildings now green buildings are the one that utilizes least amount of energy they have good illumination they have good ventilation they requires less amount of cooling effect for their buildings now if we follow all these strategies in the existing cities of india we can definitely achieve the goal of low carbon cities in india with this discussion please let us now move to the last article for the day this article was published on the science page of the hindu newspaper today and tells us about an experiment conducted by the scientist which shows that x-ray can now even be used for the single atoms previously we require over 10000 atoms to identify the kind of element so in the periodic table we know there are hundreds of elements so let's say there's an element carbon now in order to identify whether this element is carbon or not x-ray was used but for that we require at least 10000s of atoms of the carbon to identify that but now instead of 10000 we just need one single atom of carbon to identify whether it is carbon or not and in this x ray is the technology that has been used so scientists for the first time hence it is important have now identified an element by the use of x ray on a single atom of a material now until recently the minimum sample size of any element should have been 10000 atoms in order to know whether it is a particular element or not so because of this minimum amount of material atoms response to being hit by x ray can be very weak as we can now identify single atoms it is very very strong hence more atoms the better detector can pick up their response if the same technology is being allowed and we use the same 10000 atoms you can imagine the kind of accuracy we will get now let us understand how this experiment was conducted scientists have used a synchrotron x-ray scanning tunneling microscope also known by the term sxstm now this is how the functioning of this particular microscope looks like so this is your piezoelectric tube with electrodes and here is the sample of at any element let's say we have kept over here iron so iron plate has been kept over here and under this scientists have modified a conventional x-ray detector to add a sharp metal tip now in this diagram as you can see this is the particular sharp metal tip now this sharp metal tip is kept extremely close to the sample in this case we have taken the sample iron so a uh, iron will be kept at the tip of this sample so here we are going to keep iron and this closeness is so small that it is around 0.5 nanometers this is to improve the detector's ability to record any single atom from this machine so this microscope with such a small needle which is so close to iron can easily detect through the x rays that whether this is iron or not and so true with other elements as this detects the signals are being amplified and these signals are then be recorded to a central controlling unit which later is used for the processing in this process the sample atom will be hit by x ray photon the electron in the atoms will absorbed only the photon of certain frequency and this proves that elements have different frequencies when x-ray photons are hit on them so every element will show a different frequency and through the analysis of these frequency we can easily identify what kind of element has been detected using the spectroscope this is being processed and element can easily be identified now please understand this every element has a unique absorption spectrum and frequency which can be used to identify this element so iron will have different frequency copper will have different frequency gold will have different and the so is true with the silver 
Now, the significance of this experiment is that identification of the material using only one atom can revolutionize the research in the material sciences, quantum mechanics and many other fields. This study also characterizes the chemical state of a particular atom and also will help us to understand their property in a better manner, which will further help the researchers and the scientists to manipulate the atoms to a greater precision. Now let us understand the basics of X-rays. Now X-rays or the X radiation is a form of high energy electromagnetic radiation. Now on the right side as you can see this is this electromagnetic spectrum from radio wave to the gamma rays. The only thing that is visible from a naked eye is the visible spectrum which is at the center. So from red to violet is the visible spectrum that we can see from our eyes. Anything before red and anything after violet is not visible from the human eye. As far as we move from radio waves to the gamma rays, the two things are observed. First, the wavelength, as you can see the wavelength, the length between two waves are being reducing. So on the radio wave, we have higher wavelength. Higher wavelength means lesser number of frequency. So over here we have one, over here we have two. So in the distance of this much, we have just two waves. On the other hand, if you talk about gamma, in the same distance, we will have multiple waves. So what is observed is that when we move from radio wave to the gamma wave, the frequency of waves increases and wavelength reduces. Higher the frequency means there will be a higher energy and higher energy means higher penetration. And that is the reason why X-rays can easily penetrate the human skin and flesh, but not the bones. While gamma rays can easily penetrate even in the bones. So X-rays or the X-radiation is a form of high electromagnetic radiation. They have a wavelength ranging from 0.01 to 10 nanometers, which is a very high frequency. They are generated when high energy electrons interact with particular matter. They can easily ionize atoms and disrupt the molecular bonds of a particular thing. Very high radiation of X-ray or the dose of X-ray over a short period causes radiation sickness. While a lower dose can cause the radiation induced cancer. So in both the cases, X-rays are not good for the human health. In terms of historical relevance, X-rays were discovered by an accident. So while experimenting with cathode rays covered by the thick cardboard in 1895, Wilhelm Rongen noticed a light being cast on the fluorescent board. And that's how first X-ray was actually the hand of his wife who saw the image of her bones and exclaimed, I have seen my death. So he named them to be X-rays, X, the representation of the mysterious nature. So this is how X-rays were accidentally discovered and that's how it has been applied to multiple uses now. So these are the applications of the X-rays. So they are used for, of course, checking the fractures, spotting the pneumonia, that is chest X-ray and spotting the cancers and other tumors. Ionizing capabilities of the same rays can also be used for the cancer treatment to kill the malignant cell using the radiation therapy. As they have much shorter wavelengths than the visible light, as you can see on this screen. So X-rays have shorter wavelength and high frequency, which makes them possible to probe structures which are smaller than what can be seen from a normal microscope. It is used in the X-ray microscopy to acquire high resolution images and can also in X-ray crystallography to determine the position of atoms in a particular crystal. They are also used for material characterization under X-ray spectroscopy, the one that we have discussed in this article. And they can travel even through the vacuum. That is the reason why they are being received from the universe. This property allow X-ray to be used for the space exploration and the conduction of the vacuum chambers. One best example of X-ray used in space exploration is the use of X-ray in the telescopes. So X-ray telescopes are being constructed to go and observe these distant objects. 
And the last one is they can also be used for the security system in order to scan the hidden objects within the luggage of a person or a person's body. And that is the reason why they are being used as a scanner at the airports and the railway stations. That's all for today's Daily News Simplify. Thank you for watching. Stay tuned for more such updates.